40 years ago, 1984. A showman like the tech world had never seen before took the stage in a college auditorium to show the work his team had been working on for the past three years. His name was Steve Jobs, and he would introduce the world to the Macintosh. It would serve as the prototype for all personal computers going forward. Affordability and a beautiful user experience were core to the product. It was a product so ambitious and so impactful that Apple still uses its name for all of its computers. And yet, this computer that we hold in such reverence was by most measures a commercial failure, one that would end in Steve Jobs getting fired from the company he founded. This is the story of how the Macintosh created and destroyed Apple. To understand the Macintosh, we need to go back five years to 1979. Apple just updated the Apple II to include a floppy disk drive that let users download software created by developers. We've redesigned the Apple II, made it simpler, more reliable, and enhanced it with built-in features that are important to today's users. Up until this point, Apple II sales were good, and Apple had created a brand new category of consumer devices, that being the personal computer. But computers were still not mainstream. This one addition would change that. VisiCalc, released at the end of 1979 for the Apple II. It was the first spreadsheet program ever, and the big businesses on the East Coast clamored to get their hands on it. Apple catapulted from a growing startup to the fastest growing company in history. What we've done is to make the most popular personal computer ever used in business, home, schools, and laboratories even more useful for these markets. In one more year, Apple would go on to go public, making Steve Jobs worth more than $200 million, pleasing him on magazine covers and making him famous. Apple II went on to be the largest selling computer in the history of the world, and still is. But fame didn't interest Steve. Sure, the Apple II was a success, and his team was growing at a rapid pace. All he had to do was improve the specs, and Apple would have a killer product on the market. But that wasn't Steve's way. He always wanted to be at the edge of innovation, and frankly, he didn't like working on big teams. In the fast-paced computer industry, he felt that the Apple II was already growing outdated, and Apple needed a category to be defining product to remain at the edge of the personal computer movement. Around this time, some of his employees had been to this research lab near Apple called Xerox Park. They convinced Steve to join them on their next visit so he can see the research himself. It would prove to change the course of the company. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Xerox Park, you might be wondering, when we say the Xerox 914 makes copies on ordinary paper, we mean ordinary paper. Perfect copies, dry copies. It takes an extraordinary machine to make copies Yep, it's the same and... Xerox, the company that specializes in copy machines. The amount of innovation that was happening on this research campus deserves its own video. But for Steve's jobs visit, only one thing mattered, the graphical user interface. See, with the Apple II and all other computers on the market at the time, the user experience either required you to know how to program or to install software through a floppy disk drive so that you could do something that was immediately useful. It was like you had to be a wizard with arcane knowledge of secret codes to get the computer to do what you want. It wasn't very user-friendly. I had three or four people who kept bugging me that I ought to get my rear over to Xerox Park and see what they were doing. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. The display screen shows your working environment. We call this the desktop. It is an electronic analog for an office. Within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. It was, it was obvious. It's incredible to watch these old demos and still be able to recognize it as a computer. The researchers at Xerox invented a new way to think about computing. This new method did away with pure text-based screens and added visuals. It was the exact innovation needed to make computers the most powerful tool ever invented. After some negotiations, Steve allows Xerox to invest in Apple in exchange for giving Apple employees the opportunity to see a demo of this graphical user interface. And then Steve orders them to implement it into Apple's upcoming high-end computer, the Lisa. It is now 1981, and Steve has been having issues with the Lisa team that he's been leading. At this point, Steve has been very difficult to work with. He would enter meetings late, order employees how to proceed, and then leave without getting others a chance to speak. He would end meetings early if he determined that the presenter was a bozo. 
the Lisa team decided that it was too much and he gets removed as the manager. Looking for somewhere to focus his attention, he hears about a project called Macintosh. The leader of this project, Jeff Raskin, wants to create a cheap, easy-to-use consumer computer for only $1,000. The reason we're doing what we're doing is because we want to bring this to tens of millions of people. And never before has the time been riper. A small team, working on redefining what a computer was with the intent to sell it for as cheap as possible, it was the perfect idea for Steve Jobs. The message that we have with Macintosh is that it's the computer for the rest of us. Within a month of getting involved, Jeff Raskin, the original man behind the name, and one of the guys that told Steve about Xerox Park, was out. Him and Steve didn't get along, so Steve forced him to take a leave of absence. Now that Steve had his ideal project, he had to recruit the wizards to make it happen. Andy Hertzfeldt was one of those wizards. He met Steve to talk about the position. Are you any good? We only want really good people working on the Macintosh, and I'm not sure you're good enough. Yes, I think I'm good. I've already helped out Burl on some of the software for the Mac. I heard you're creative. Are you really creative? I can't be the judge of that, but I'd love to work on the team. I'll let you know. Two hours later. Steve finds him again. I've got good news for you. You're on the Mac team now. Let's go to your new desk. That's great. I just need a day or two to hand off the work I've been doing for the new OS for Apple II. No, you're wasting your time with that. Who cares about the Apple II? The Apple II will be dead in a few years. Your OS will be obsolete before it's finished. The Macintosh is the future of Apple, and you're going to start on it now. Steve then proceeds to unplug Andy's computer, erasing hours of work, and they go to the building the Mac team was based out of. He was not an easy man to work for, but he was persuasive. In fact, it's during this time that Bud Tribble, another member of the Mac team, coined the term that eventually would become synonymous with Steve Jobs. Steve has a reality distortion field. In his presence, reality is malleable. He can convince anyone of practically anything. It wears off when he's not around, but it makes it hard to have realistic schedules. So began the effort to bring forth the Macintosh, an effort that would end up taking almost three years from the time Steve Jobs took over. The three years that it took this elite team to create the Macintosh are full of interesting bits of Apple lore, and it served as the project that Steve would begin crafting the clean design aesthetic that Apple is known for. A couple of stories from this time stand out. When Bill Atkinson, the programmer most responsible for translating the demos from Xerox Park into the GUIs on the Lisa and the Mac, came to show his progress on drawing rectangles and ovals, Steve did not give the reaction he imagined. Well, circles and rectangles are good, but how about drawing rectangles with rounded corners? Can we do that? No, it can't be done, and I don't think we really need it. Rectangles with rounded edges are everywhere. Desks, whiteboards, and tables. Let's go for a walk, and you'll see that there are even more outside practically everywhere you look. It seemed like such a small detail to care for, and yet he was completely right. This attention to detail coupled with the raw genius of the engineers and the designers led to a UI that defined what a personal computer was. Today, rounded corners exist everywhere, especially on Apple devices. Other staples of Apple's aesthetics were created during this time, like the command symbol. The bitten app artist, Susan Kerr, looked through her dictionary of international symbols until she found the command symbol that we all know today. But it was originally used on Swedish and other Nordic maps to indicate a place of interest. These two moments are just part of what made the Macintosh so insanely great. There are countless little details that the group of engineers implemented that came together to form a cohesive user experience. Things like overlapping windows, moving files to a trash can to delete them. All of them small, but the details made the product and Steve wouldn't let any detail slide. This group of people, are, they're more like artists than they are engineers. They're not really interested in careers. What they're interested in is doing something insanely great and then getting it out into the world to leverage their energy. As the 1984 deadline loomed, it wasn't uncommon for the software engineers to stay long after dinner, even occasionally doing all-nighters to get the job done. It was now the beginning of 1984, and the Macintosh was slated to be released on January 24th. It was crunch time. The software team worked overtime to get all the bugs out for release. After almost three years and a few setbacks, Steve was ready to unveil the Macintosh to the world. And even though some of the engineers tried to get him to push back one more time, he refused. The Macintosh was coming. Any bugs left would stay there. So the software team worked until literally the last minute possible, staying all weekend in the office to fix as many bugs as they could before the software had to be finalized. Knowing he had a killer product on his hands, Steve needed the marketing campaign to build up the hype. His agency pitched in on an idea that every other company had turned down so far, 
make a reference to 1984 by George Orwell and show the Macintosh as liberation from Big Brother, where every other CEO decided that the idea was too risky. Steve runs with it and decides it will only be aired once, so they need to make it count. Super Bowl 18, a matchup between the two best teams in the National Football League. Only 12 seconds left to play third quarter. Here's Marcus Allen. Cutting back up field, and Marcus Allen could be gone. Seventy-four yards for Marcus Allen. And the Raiders are starting to shove this one in the winner's column. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary. After a touchdown scored by the Raiders in the third quarter, the screens across America went black for a full two seconds. The ad you see here, directed by Ridley Scott, played for more than 96 million people. It was an ad unlike any they had ever seen. In the era before YouTube, the ad became a viral sensation. The news networks replayed it again and again that night. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Now, with a great public buildup, Steve needed a demo to match the hype. After the engineers had worked non-stop over the weekend, they slept for a day and returned in the afternoon for Steve to hammer them again. Hey, pick yourselves up off the floor. You're not done yet. We need a demo for the intro. Tired as they were, they were excited to show off the capabilities this machine that they had spent years working on had. They got to work on demo. It is January 24th, 1984. The day of reckoning had come. The audience knew the day would be special. Steve Jobs goes to the stand and he unveils the Macintosh, and a computer spoke for the first time. We'd like to let uh, Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I'm Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. He goes on to show the Mac and the crowd is ecstatic. While this wasn't the first time Apple had released a computer with a GUI, the Lisa, which was released the year before, was priced in an astounding $10,000. The Mac wasn't necessarily cheap by any means, coming in at $2,500 rather than the originally planned $1,000, but it was cheaper than any other options on the market. Most importantly though, it was beautiful and it was human. On that day in 1984, mass market personal computers went from an arcane black screen that required codes to magically get stuff done to the device that we still recognize as a computer. Steve was a visionary, and his demand for excellence with this small team had produced something that left a dent in the universe. Immediately, he was showered with praise, landing on magazine covers and increasing his fame to new heights. Within his own company, the CEO and board decides to give him back management over the failing Lisa team, and he combines them to form one large organization. But the high would soon come down. Steve began to return to his worst habits. During the creation of the Mac, Steve had recruited the CEO of PepsiCo, John Scully, by invoking his reality distortion field and saying, Do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life or come with me and change the world? Their relationship between the two was good while Steve was cast away on his small Mac team. But now that he was given more employees to work with, he tried to undermine Scully and take control of larger parts of Apple. On top of that, after users began to get their hands on the Macintosh, they realized that it wasn't that great of a product. See, the Macintosh was beautiful and it was cheap, but this came at the cost of performance. The beautiful graphics took up so much processing power on the weak chip, but there wasn't much room left to run intensive applications. On top of that, the Macintosh was not compatible with any Apple II software, providing little reason for users to upgrade. Sales began to flounder. By the end of 1984, sales dropped dramatically, the Apple II was still accounting for 70% of all Apple sales, even though the experience was vastly inferior. Users, especially the business guys on the East Coast, needed the spreadsheet software that Visicuck provided, and they couldn't get it on the Macintosh just yet. Critical members of the Macintosh team began to leave. They poured their soul into building a product, and many needed time off. Andy Hertzfeld took a leave of absence. Burrell ended up quitting soon after, and he would go on to leave the tech industry forever a few years later. Even Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak left, although at this point he was still working on the Apple II. Steve could have had a potentially great follow-up to the Mac, 
Thanks to Moore's law, the chip power available for computers was doubling roughly every two years. He could have used this massive improvement in performance to create a follow-up product that could have addressed most of the important issues users had with the Macintosh. But again, this was not Steve's way. He began thinking about creating a Macintosh in a book. He began seeking out touchscreen technology and high-resolution displays. But Steve wasn't CEO of Apple yet. Scully and Steve began to argue frequently. Scully didn't care about the product at all. He saw Steve's obsession with details, design, and the working of computers as a distraction to the profits to be made from incremental improvements. Computers were fundamentally a commodity business to Scully. Just create the most powerful machine and people would buy your product. Steve, of course, knew this to be wrong. It was around this time that Steve considered replicating the experience he had at making the Macintosh to focus on other projects. Small, concentrated teams reimagining the future. He considered making a division within Apple called Apple Labs that would let him do that. Scully was inclined to agree. It would get him out of the way and control his terrible management skills. But then Steve would change his mind again last minute and start asserting his dominance on teams within Apple. They could not reach an agreement. What plays out next rivals even the best scenes in succession. The board meets and listens to both Steve and John Scully. Steve makes an impassioned speech to the board that Scully doesn't understand the product and he's been running Apple to the ground. The board tells Steve that his teams have been mismanaged and he's been creating more problems than he was solving. Scully presents and gives the board an ultimatum. You can take me back and then I can take responsibility for running the company. Or we can do nothing and you'll need to find a new CEO for Apple. They all side with John Scully. Steve would be given the opportunity to create new products at Apple Labs, but he would no longer run the Macintosh team. Feeling rejected from his board, people that he trusted up until this point, Steve sees one last opportunity to take control. Apple had just been given the rights to sell computers in China, and Scully was planning to go to represent the company. With the CEO across the Pacific, it was the perfect time for Steve to launch a coup. Steve begins gathering his supporters and tells a colleague, Jean-Louis Gassé, his plan. Gassé had recently come from Paris to take over the Macintosh division from Steve. Realizing that a coup would jeopardize his move across the Atlantic, Glassé turns his back on Steve and tells Scully, if you leave for China tomorrow, you could be gone. Steve's plotting to get rid of you. Scully cancels his trip, and the next day he walks into a full boardroom. He confronts Steve. It's come to my attention that you'd like to throw me out of the company. I'd like to ask you if that's true. I think you're bad for Apple, and I think you're the, you're the wrong person to run the company. You really should leave this company. You don't know how to operate and never have. I wanted you here to help me grow, and you've been ineffective in helping me. Enough of this. Let's take a vote. Me or Steve Jobs? One by one, all of the executives of the company side with John Scully. Again. Steve had shown his method of management before, and it was chaos. The coup failed, and Steve was out. The board eventually agreed to strip him of all operational duties. He would only be allowed to serve as the executive chairman. No team to work with, no products to build, nothing but a figurehead. For a product visionary like Steve, this was as bad as a death sentence. He was depressed. So he decides to go to Europe to see if he can find clarity. He visits museums and performs some minor duties for Apple, but to no avail. Life was just not the same if he couldn't build anything. He returns from Europe and stumbles upon a group of people working on visual effects for George Lucas's Star Wars and is blown away. Recognizing the talent this group has, Steve tries to get the Apple board to acquire them, but they ignore him. This group would eventually receive funding from Steve Jobs' personal fortune, and they would call themselves Pixar. But for now, he was ignored. Seeing no way out of his desperate situation, he decides to leave Apple. He begins to plot his leave and starts convincing several high-profile Apple employees to join him. Scully finds out and is enraged, but they come to an agreement. On September 16th, 1985, Steve leaves Apple completely. It's almost uncanny how much this half of the story represents the archetypical hero's journey. Steve starts and founds Apple Computer, finds massive success with the Apple II, and then assembles what can only be called the adventures of early computing to create a breakthrough user experience in the Macintosh, only for it to fail commercially. This failure, combined with his terrible management, leads to his figurative death. His firing from Apple would end up being the exact rebirth he needed. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pixar, 
and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. Pixar went on to create the world's first computer animated feature film, Toy Story, and is now the most successful animation studio in the world. In a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next, and I returned to Apple, and the technology we developed at Next is at the heart of Apple's current renaissance. During his time away, he learned from his mistakes and improved his management. Meanwhile, Apple under John Scully floundered. Without a product leader running the company, Apple lost its soul. What happens next is a story we're all familiar with. Steve Jobs is metaphorically reborn when he takes control of Apple in 1997, creating the Apple we all know today, focused on in making insanely great products. All it took was getting fired for it to happen. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometime if you enjoyed this story about how the Macintosh was created and eventually led to Steve's firing from Apple, please subscribe and hit that like button. Leave a comment and let me know what other stories you'd like to hear.